begin. Let me welcome you. Welcome everyone to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have two guests who are just brilliant and talking about an incredibly important subject. And I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Uh, we have two wonderful scholars, wonderful academic leaders, and now consultants, Chuck Ambrose and Mike Nitzel. They have written a recent book, which you can see in the bottom left of the screen, called Colleges on the Brink, where based on their experience in presidential offices and based on their research, they talk us through what financial exigency means for colleges and universities. It's an incredibly clearly written book with lots of lavish details that really works you, th you know, walks you through all kinds of ways that campuses can come to the financial brink. And if you haven't had a chance to read it, I strongly, strongly recommend it. Now, without any further ado, let me bring them both on stage. First, I'm gonna start off doing this in alphabetical order. I'm gonna bring up Chuck Ambrose. And greetings, sir. Hello, Brian. Good to be with you. So thanks for the invitation. Well, it's a, I'm so glad you could join us. And uh, I'm, like I said, I'm really grateful for your book. Um, listen, Chuck, on the, on the forum, we ask people to talk about, when they introduce themselves, what they're going to be working on for the next year. Now, I'm curious, what are the projects that are top of mind for you? And, and what ideas are really most important for you looking into the rest of 2024? Uh, you know, it's a great question. Brian, again, uh, you know, I, I think our planning horizons have shortened, right? We used to think about five-year horizons. And mm -hmm. uh, it, it'd be great if I could tell you what I was doing for the next year. I, I, I'd like to know what I'm doing next month. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, without question, I, I think this conversation and, and all of uh, the people in it could agree that we're, you're, we're at an inflection point, right, for what is higher education. And I think... Uh, you know, the next year we'll be focused on two things, right? Where are we in our current state and how can we do best for our students, uh, our faculty, our staff, our communities to see through the storm, right? We're very much kind of in the eye of the storm. Uh, over this next year, though, and I, I think, you know, obviously with uh, kind of the sunset of HERF money and a lot of other factors, uh, I, I think we're going to be considering what's next at a speed uh, and an accelerated purpose uh, that maybe I haven't experienced in my administrative lifetime, it's going to be very exciting, right? Because uh, the future is going to, to help us create what's possible. It's going to be different. I, I think the difference in the change management uh, is not easy, uh, but helping institutions from where they have been to where they're going uh, is, is my primary focus using Again, 25 years as a CEO of tools and experiences, hopefully, uh, to lock arms and consider what's next. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I, I hope the forum can help with those kind of conversations as we try to work through this inflection point. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing from your wealth of, of experience and insight. But before I ask you any more questions, let me uh, bring your colleague on board. Uh, and uh, let's see if we can get Mike Nitzel. Now, Mike, uh, I've, I've been teased before about having bookshelves in the background, but I have to defer to you because you, your bookshelf game is definitely higher than mine. Uh, greetings, sir, and welcome to the forum. Brian, it's good to be with you. Thanks for the invitation. Hello, Chuck. Hello, Mike. Good to, good to see you again. Uh, we're looking forward to the conversation, Brian. Thanks again. Well, it's definitely my pleasure. Now, Mike, you, you heard the question I put to Chuck. How about yourself, insofar as you can glimpse the rest of the year out? What are you going to be working on, and what topics are going to be up your uppermost in mind? Well, Brian, as, as you know, and, and some of the participants may know as well, I'm a senior contributor for Forbes, writing online about higher education, and I plan to continue to do that on a regular basis. I think, as Chuck suggested, there'll be a particular focus on budget issues. Uh, and unfortunately, there is no shortage of news being made on that front. Almost daily, it seems, we encounter an institution that is having to go through uh, considerable finance, is going through considerable financial turmoil and making significant budget reductions as a result of that. So yeah. that's yeah. going to continue to be uh, a focus in the writing and the occasional consulting I do. Um, and, you know, we'll see what this next uh, 
year or two brings as far as uh, there has been a small recovery in enrollment uh, for colleges and universities, although most people think that's probably a temporary bump rather than a reversal of the downward trajectory that's been with us really since almost 2010. So that I'm going to be monitoring that and writing about some other interesting topics for, for Forbes on higher education. Excellent. Well, your Forbes columns are a real pleasure to read. Um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to what you get to say. Um, but I'm also, more to the point, looking forward to what you get to say today. Um, uh, both of you, your, your book ha is uh, admirably clear. Uh, I, I found that it was just pellucid as glass. Uh, I could see what your points were. You back everything up with solid research. Um, I mean, I just wish I could uh, send you after quite a few writers uh, so they could learn how to do this well from you. And at one point, you have this uh, fantastic uh, line where you describe exactly what you're going to be talking about. I just want to read from this really quickly. Uh, what does it mean for campus culture, morale? Excuse me, excuse me. We described a set of tools which when properly used can help colleges step back from the brink, reassess their finances, restructure their academic programs, rebalance their budgets and forge a more sustainable future. We concentrate specifically on financial exigency scenarios when colleges are forced to employ every tool of transformation at their disposal. We discuss the proper steps as well as the common mistakes that colleges take, either when they declare financial exigency or when they attempt a large scale restructuring without formally declaring exigency. So if, if and this is exactly what you do. And I, I'd like to start off by asking you, I thought financial exigency was a pretty clear term of art, but you were actually, you broke this down and said that the term is a little fuzzy. It's changed over time. And uh, some institutions have come up with their own different versions of that. Um, what's, what's your working, you know, street level definition of financial exigency these days? You know, Brian, I, I want to say one thing as we start, because uh, just your comments about our, our book, uh, if I would have an encouragement to anyone who's got a book in them out into the future, it is to find a good co-author like Mike Nitzel, who uh, can take complex thoughts, uh, build on them, and then state them with clarity, right? So I've got to say up front that this was a a friendship bound uh, out of our work together in Missouri over a decade ago. But at the same time, uh, as people read the book, they, they need to recognize uh, Mike's got um, one of those gifts, right, of, of clarity to, uh, to communicate. Uh, and, and, you know, there's a lot of people who communicate the definition of exigency, uh, but it may be one of the, the more misunderstood terms, uh, mainly out of fear that you hope you never have to use it right? Uh, some translation to bankruptcy in the corporate and business sector, which uh, has some commonalities, but uh, some, some real differences. And, um, you know, it's kind of a confluence of the AUP and others. Um, Moody's, who has a regular circular on financial restructure, restructuring that says uh, exigency can be defined for those who have waited too long or who fail to act that puts the survival of the institution at risk. Mm. Mm. And, uh, it is not, a, I mean, it, it's more than a third rail, right? I, I'm going to say that when you say that the survival of the institution is at risk, uh, you're really talking about some of the hardest decisions that leaders have to make up against the risk of closing an institution, right? So uh, it's uh, stakes are quite high. Uh, and again, Mike and I, and, and Mike uh, contributed significantly to this, the near exigencies, uh, you know, that's a discussion that happens on many campuses. Uh, why are we really doing this? And uh, if my dog did that, my shoulder would fall off. Right? <laughs> But that's, uh, that's the definition from a, a practitioner standpoint that I it's certainly leaned in when we had to, to utilize the tool. I, I might just add a couple things to that, Brian. Um, the term itself goes back uh, 100 years. Mm. And typically, people begin with an early definition by AAUP. 
Um, it, so it was fa it was a faculty driven um, conceptualization, at least initially. Mm. Now, AAUP has its own definition has gone through several iterations as it tries to deal with different kinds of institutions and different kinds of severity of financial crisis. But basically, it's a financial crisis that threatens that's so severe that it threatens the mission, the overall mission of the institution. As, oh. Chuck, as Chuck suggested, a number of colleges and universities have come up with their own definitions. And those uh, often involve something a little less formal or a little less dramatic than what AAUP envisioned with their definition. And often the intent of that is to short circuit some of the procedural uh, requirements or recommendations that AAUP had in place for declaring financial exigency. So when you talk about near exigency or financial crisis, interesting financial emergency, those are all things you'll see institutions talk about. They're often trying to kind of have their cake and eat it too, mm. which is mm. to signal how bad the budget has become right. without necessarily declaring and going through all of the um, procedures that a formal declaration of exigency ah. requires. Ah. Why does this all matter? Frankly, one of the biggest reasons is because exigency is the tool that institutions use to terminate the contracts of tenured faculty. Now, as our guests know, there are other reasons that can happen for cause, but for an institutional reason, exigency is the trigger that can um, result in tenured faculty losing their contracts. Well, both of you, thank you for, for taking this. Uh, both Chuck, you, you know, the story of your experience um, bringing a campus back from the brink is a very, very moving one, a very, very important one. And and Mike, I, I love the history of this. It's just it's just fascinating to see the term uh, broken down in such a in such a scholarly way. You should also know, Mike, that in, in the chat, uh, as you were speaking, uh, Kate Bellanier says, is it fair to assume that declaring some kind of crisis allows schools to break existing contracts? And you immediately answered her. Um, and so it was it was just perfect, uh, almost telepathic communication. Um, what uh, what are some of the other com well let me, let me back up um, in, in your book you discuss something like 10 uh, 15 percent of American colleges and universities might confront this kind of um, financial brinksmanship in the in the near future um, what's what's led us to that point is is it the end of the federal covid dollars are there other structural forces behind that kind of economic fragility that we should be aware of Want go to go first? I'll go, ahead on. You, you, I'll go you, first you, and, uh, and then yeah. clean, clean it up for me. <laughs> um, uh, well, of course, a major contribution to it has been enrollment declines, steady enrollment declines and the loss of tuition revenue associated uh, with that. Um, but you also have other factors. You Clearly, inflation in the past five years, uh, increasing labor costs, the fact that universities, in some cases, have borrowed too much money to go ahead and build physical structures in the hope that that can help attract students. Uh, and yeah. so they're pretty highly leveraged as far as the debt that they've uh, brought on board. Uh -huh. um, you probably have greater subsidies for non-academic activities like athletics uh, than universities can afford. So it's a confluence of forces um, coming together, particularly, although not exclusively, but particularly at regional public universities, uh -huh. small private liberal arts colleges that are not particularly selective in their admission practices, uh -huh. and community colleges. Uh -huh. I think what has been shocking to people, however, is to see that begin to creep into institutions that you would not have thought it to be likely uh, uh, to, to see. For example, you've had four Big Ten universities with significant financial crises. You've had uh, DePaul, the largest Catholic oh, university, wow. University of Arizona, West Virginia University. Your, your participants will all recognize these are, have been multi-million dollar budget holes 
that universities are trying to plug. Um, so I think you have all of those coming together. You, you mentioned COVID. COVID clearly was um, a stressor on these financial problems. But our book tries to clarify that, in fact, during COVID, universities saw three pulses of federal money totaling about uh, $76 billion. Mm -hmm. And that's the HERF, the Higher mm -hmm. Education uh, Relief Fund. About half of that had to go directly back to students, but the other half universities and colleges could use to plug budget holes. Unfortunately, what a lot of them did was they plugged the holes, but they kept on with business pretty much as usual. Ah. Those, those HERF dollars are gone now, and the cushion that they provided no longer present. So I think you're seeing a, a post-COVID sag from the fact that those uh, HERF funds are no longer there providing the buoyancy, uh, albeit temporary, that college has had for a while. What else, Chuck? Well, and, and, you know, Brian, Mike, and I, our, our paths actually crossed uh, first uh, in, in Missouri in the summer of 2010. And I, I would, as Mike knows, I take perhaps a, a little different perspective on most things. But uh, in the midst of the recession, I, I was president of a small uh, United Methodist College outside of Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I actually attribute most of our systemic uh, challenges solely based on college costs. Uh, you know, with with college competing with healthcare over the last mm -hmm. several decades is the fastest increasing cost of American families. Consumer based economy, right? How much do we have in our pockets to spend? And uh, as privates discounted, right, tuition aggressively for. 30 years to, to drive enrollment. Uh, when the recession hit, you know, I, I actually thought we would have some rebalance of uh, value, right? That we, we couldn't continue to accelerate costs beyond people's means. But of course, we also had another infusion of federal dollars. Uh, and at the same time, uh, in the midst of transitioning from the private sector into the public sector, uh, public institutions began to discount their tuition. Uh, how many states give uh, in-state tuition to out-of-state students, which would be a, a roughly 50% discount? Right. Uh, and uh, as Mike was governor advisor uh, to, at that time, Governor Jay Nixon, we shouldered together in Missouri to try, and this was Governor Nixon's agenda, to try to keep our cost increases the lowest in the country, and we did, right? Uh, but again, as we go through COVID, uh, inflation and all those factors that, that Mike pointed out, uh, the only way that institutions had to generate more resources would be to grow enrollment, uh, but they utilized tuition discounting, uh, and the more students we recruited, the less cash we had, right? So uh, there, there's actually three structural deficits that I would contend that most senior leaders and most campuses recognize exist. Uh, but it's both the will and uh, the how to fix uh, that serves as the challenge, right? We know the margins have been diminished on the basis uh, of discounting our costs where students are willing or able to pay. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a significant completion uh, in, in college outcome uh, gaps that again, COVID kind of ripped the Band-Aid off, but uh, when our completion rates and our graduation rates still do not meet the needs of underserved students, first generation Pell eligible students of color, uh, you know, we are again utilizing Title IV support for students who are not staying and completing their degrees. And then the last is the, just the cost of building programs and delivering them. And that's something our book really does focus in on is instructional uh, outcomes and inst instructional performance. When you add all three of those deficits up, right, uh, and uh, do it year over year with uh, compounding uh, operating deficits. Mm -hmm. And uh, just like sometimes we do in our own homes, we've run out of our savings. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not bringing in enough income to cover our monthly expenses. Uh, and now we've got a cash problem. Brian, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll just uh, add uh, one other thing for, your, for folks to chew on. You mentioned 10 to 15 percent 
uh, of institutions facing uh, a financial crisis in the future. I just want to clarify, we don't, we're not saying 10 to 15 percent will go through exigency. We're, we're anticipating 10 to 15 percent are going to face some pretty serious financial shortfalls that they're going to have to grapple with. Exigency may or may not be necessary for all of those. And, and Chuck and I have a little split among, even among ourselves in terms of the severity of that uh, uh, problem. I think he predicted to be a little higher. I, I would a little lower. Um, but just to be sure, we're not saying 15 percent of institutions are going to face exigency in the next 10 years. Thank you. Uh, thank you both. Uh, this is a, a, a seminar level uh, description of, of these problems. Uh, and I, I really appreciate hearing from, from both of you. Uh, friends, uh, I'm going to ask a, another uh, quick question, and then I want to turn this over to all of you. Uh, so please uh, prepare your questions. And if you'd like, put them in the uh, Q&A box so I can flash them on the screen. Or if you'd like to join us on stage, uh, it's pretty clear that uh, there is no hair requirement to be on stage here. Um, <laughs> Uh, and and, uh, and and no necessary animal requirement either. So um, please, you know, press the raise hand button if you'd like to join us. Uh, we have a, a question from our dear friend George Station out at uh, California State University, who couldn't make it today, uh, and he asks a kind of good overall question: uh, What does it mean for campus culture, morale, and retention when an administration sees financial exigency as the right path? And he then goes on to define campus to equal students, faculty, and staff. So what does it mean for campus culture, morale, and retention when you go down the road of exigency? Well, uh, you know, I th that's a wonderful question. And it's one that we actually deal with quite a bit uh, because so much of the cultural consequences of a financial crisis depends on how the university addresses it. And I think we try to be pretty clear that we do see a problem with staff and many faculty and students not really understanding the financial situations that colleges and universities are in. They don't understand the budget. Um, and that is the responsibility of a president and a provost, a vice president for administration to make those implications as clear as can be. And we talk pretty specifically, Brian, about what every president should know about the budget and then what members of the campus should know. And if they're not equipped with that information, I think exigency is going to be a very destructive process. It's hard under the best mm -hmm. of circumstances. Let's, mm -hmm. let's acknowledge that. And, and Chuck is in a great position to talk about that more personally, having taken an institution through it. It's always going to be painful and emotionally uh, traumatic. But to not have the main constituents of a college know what's going on and understand the need for it, I think can be quite destructive to the culture. Wow. Yeah, and um, Brian, I, I think it'd be helpful to know that, uh, you know, I volunteered in the fall of 2021 to, to go to Henderson because in, in many ways, the Henderson State University story mirrored some of uh, well, I don't say mirrored some, I'll say mirrored all of the structural deficits that most private and public colleges can face in a worst case scenario, right? So the, the Henderson State story only applies to everyone in, the, in terms of scale, right? So when things go bad, when bad is bad, uh, and you know, most campus cultures, when colleges feel distress, know, right, that they're in a position of challenge. And I'll just give you probably uh, the, the most prevalent example is if you're slow to pay your, your bills, if you're sliding on your payrolls, hmm. uh, a coach yeah. turns in a receipt. Why, why did this not get paid, right? Uh, well, if that happens long enough over time, then you start thinking perhaps that we don't have cash, right? That we're, or if students can't pay their bills, right? If, if they're leaving and not being able, so, uh, you know, two simple data points, right? Where are you in your payables and where are you in your student account receivables? Can tell you. Uh, and uh, I, I actually, um, and, and Mike helped us communicate this, I think every campus 
should understand how they are operating on a modified cash budget. How much you're bringing in every month, how much goes out every month, and what's the surplus. Um, I will say this rather strongly. I'm not really sure why campuses don't understand their operating integrity better than they do. Many of them, they've got huge balance sheets and they don't have to. Yeah. But that neglect, right, is not just in terms of crisis, it's how you allocate your resources, right? So if you can improve your financial performance, uh, an example I've given many times, uh, we had over 100 programs at the University of Central Missouri, but we had 11, 11 programs that serviced over 40% of our students. Wow. They were our signature programs, right? right. They were high demand, high outcome, meeting community-based needs. But do you think we really changed the, the allocation of resources to those programs to help make them better over mm. time? Mm. Probably not. Mm. Right? So it's a uh, mm. campus culture can be significantly enhanced with the stewardship of your resources because everyone benefits. But over time, and again, these don't happen overnight and exigency does not accumulate in one bad enrollment cycle. Uh, it's years of having to discount tuition to, you know, and, and, and then your margins begin to shrink and then the available, or as Mike said, external folk, you know, factors that you can't control, which we're in that type of inflationary environment right now. Yeah. Assuming too much debt, right? You go on a, a been pretty well documented at the University of Chicago, just the, the burden of capital debt that has a, a accelerated, right? So these don't happen overnight. Most campuses aren't surprised. Many will say somebody's got to make the hard decisions. Uh, now, when those de decisions affect me, then that's when it gets to be personal. Yes. And hurtful and impactful and human. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a very good example right now that you're uh, that folks could look at that I think illustrates how a university is trying to go about a pretty significant financial restructuring hmm. in a way that really respects shared governance and does it in a planful way. And that's Marquette hmm. uh, in, in, in Milwaukee. Recently, hmm. Marquette said we're going to have to shave thirty one million dollars off our budget. The result of enrollment losses, inflation. We're going to do that over six years, and we're going to have it be a campus-wide process to arrive at the decisions that will allow us to do that. Um, that's what you need to see, and it begins to help people understand that, and, and this is a misconception that I can say I know exists on college campuses. Mm. Budgets, budgets are not money, but budgets are plans, and uh, universities that get in trouble treat budgets as if they're they're cash they're not right uh, um marquette yeah. i think is a institution to watch as it goes about this process in a pretty deliberative and at least initially it looks like thoughtful way and they also reinforce one other point chuck made which is they explicitly acknowledge that too much tuition discounting has gotten them uh, to be in some of this trouble really where, where they have used institutional aid and many universities use their institutional aid not for need-based financial aid but for so-called merit scholarship mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. discounting the amount of tuition that many students could pay without that financial aid uh of course it's a it's a uh, scramble to keep your enrollments up but at some point it actually begins to lose your money and Marquette has acknowledged that. Well, that's a really, really good pointer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Marquette has been in the news off and on for various reasons, and it's really good to, to have that focus. Um, thank you both for that very, very detailed answer um, to, to this question. Um, uh, Chuck, you, you mentioned uh, debt. And I just wanted to quickly throw out a question from Marilyn Smith. Uh, Marilyn asked, can you comment on public confidence in colleges and how that's affecting revenue. And also, if you could say a bit more about deferred maintenance and technical debt. Yeah, technical debt, right, is uh, 
What, what a great question, Marilyn, because, uh, you know, with the investment that schools are making, especially in AI and, and uh, where that the technical amenities, right, they're starting to talk about is going, what students are going to expect. It's, it's incredibly, uh, incredibly high. Um, so, Brian, you know, I, I'm going to go back to a point I made earlier, and I, uh, I think I feel more strongly today about this. You know, students really hire us to do three jobs. Uh, first is to open the door of access and opportunity to make college possible. Uh, the second is to get us across the finish line with a degree. Uh, and then the third is to make sure that degree makes us competitive in both life and work for purposes. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. uh, and over time, uh, I believe the escalating cost of college when people have to either uh, borrow or uh, can't reach their aspirational sense of place with where they would hope to go to college, when people cannot access college, they're going to devalue. Uh, and uh, in July, uh, the Department of Education is going to require us to consider a uh, financial transparency value that basically will uh, allow institutions to post on their website a debt to earnings ratio to say that what I expect to earn out of a program equals what I've had to pay and borrow uh, to access it. Mm. Mm. Now, you know, I'm going to assume responsibility for that because I have pushed, right, the cost of a college degree by virtue of how we fund higher education to a place where students are having a very difficult time accessing. And the natural question from very smart students and their families who are astute consumers, is it really worth it? Uh, and if it were me, and it, it's not, so I, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I've got the answer to this question, but to crack the, the cost discount value equation, uh, we, we simply have to stop raising tuition by thinking that's going to generate the needed resources to continue to operate our institutions. It's, mm. We've blown through the elasticity to a point mm. where people have under, uh, you know, wise consideration questions at value, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, not to mention, uh, and as Marilyn considered, uh, aging campuses, aging uh, facilities. Uh, you know, if, if we think we have a different time keeping up with operations, uh, what about capital, uh, just maintenance and repair, duty to care, duty to maintain a safe environment for our students? Uh, and uh, so again, you know, a bit of an inflection point to say that whether it's consolidation, whether it's a merger, whether we actually do have too many institutions and we need to make the ones we have better, right? Mm -hmm. By virtue of uh, kind of the process by which we have to make those hard decisions. Uh, that, that really is the inflection point, right? To say that uh, current state will be sustainable to, to present. And my, Mike and, and, and Brian, you're, you're you, you led about the 10 to 15%. I mean, Moody's and the rating agencies, Fitch would say that as many as 70% of private colleges aren't presenting enough operating revenues to pay for their operating expenses. Wow. Right? How many? 70? 70. Wow. So depending on the strength of your, your balance sheet, right, and your, your endowment and your other assets, that's how you make it work. But again, we've run out of savings. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, so I, I think part of colleges on the brink is not only to say, and, and again, Mike and I were the perfect balance of it, it's not a sky's falling. It is a, we need to do things differently. Right. Yeah. I think Marilyn's question is, is a terrific one. And, um, the, the sagging confidence in higher education comes at a time when you have uh, a lot more alternatives to traditional college and university for advanced education that students are beginning to take, I think, more seriously. Uh, whether it's companies providing training programs, whether it's new online institutions, whether it's for-profits, 
the competition is growing traditional college student um, uh, enrollment. And um, that has contributed, I think, to some of the en soft enrollment numbers that we've seen for a number of years here. Uh, on deferred maintenance, you know, it's it's much easier to get a have a donor um, give you money for a new building yeah. than it is than it is uh, for the yeah. the uh, maintenance of the buildings you have. Um, but that's a significant problem. I think you'll you'll see in the next couple of weeks there's going to be a report coming out that estimates the magnitude of deferred maintenance at American colleges and universities, and it's going to be staggering. It has been staggering, but it's going to grow because it's the easiest thing to put off, even when, as a leader, you know, you're being penny wise and pound foolish to do it. Marilyn, thank you for the great question. Uh, and thank you both, Chuck and Mike, for that incredibly detailed answer. Uh, we have we have more questions coming in. I want to make sure people get a chance to ask them. And friends, if you haven't had a chance to yet, just use the Q and A box. Um, and in fact, let me just show you an example of one of those. This comes to us from uh, Elaine Lazda at the University of Albany, where she's a library strategist, and she asks this question about an example. Uh, are you are your guests familiar with the College of Saint Rose in Albany? They tried to go big, essentially, and the school is shutting down after this semester. Are you saying retrenchment is a wiser way to go? Uh, I am somewhat familiar with the, the St. Rose situation. Uh, and um, I, I, I don't want to make a blanket statement that retrenchment is the smarter way to go uh, for every institution. But I would say that I don't think most institutions are going to be successful with a strategy of trying to grow their way out of this. Um, no. it, it, you know, it, it, yes, try to improve your enrollments the best that you increase your enrollments the most effective way you can. Um, but the traditional way of doing that by giving more financial institutional financial aid is a, is a financial loser for institutions. So I don't want to make a blanket statement, but I think retrenchment ought to be serious, more seriously considered by institutions like a St. Rose that are facing the financial difficulties that they are. Thanks. And Brian, you know, I, I would commend an article that Karen Fisher wrote uh, a year ago fall called The Shrinking of Higher Education. And mm -hmm. it, was the, it was the lead for the fall kind of uh, focus for where colleges were. And, and she wrote that. I. Uh, Matter of fact, since I've had a chance to talk to several graduate classes in higher education and, uh, you know, again, I had to confess as a, a college president, that was the only thing I was trained to do. That's how we that, that's how we led. Right. Was to, to grow enrollment, to grow revenue, to raise money, to build buildings, to mm -hmm. become bigger. And um, it's it's deep culture. Right. Uh, in, in regards to. Uh, whether you attribute it to the recession and the reset on cost, whether you think about kind of the, the systemic band-aid being pulled off with COVID, uh, changing demographics, alternative ways of learning, changing nature of students and learning, all, all of these things coupled together, uh, it's just that those strategies, as Mike said, will not work, right? Uh, and so there is, uh, we need to learn to shrink uh, and if you're on an institutional campus and you start thinking about uh, academic program review, if you think about retrenchment, uh, if you think uh, about uh, program viability, all of those are steps towards a restructuring to thinking about being more net productive that if you, if you utilize, you can improve your performance. If you wait too long, then you may end up at an exigency. Uh, within the book, uh, we had a good friend, Sarah Chamberlain, that did some graphic works for us that put kind of the steps towards exigency and you can feel it on a campus and you know it as a leader. The, the things, again, I, I, I used to say that, you know, on one side of our brain, we knew where the problems were. On the left side of the brain, we knew that there was all these tools that we hope we never have to use yeah. and we work every day trying not to cut someone's budget, trying not to 
you know, limit your positions and say that we can't hire people or invest or, you know, build. Uh, but the more that we did those things, the more we pushed that target of financial viability away. Thank you. It makes me think of, uh, you know, break glass uh, in case of fire, right? Um, we had uh, earlier, earlier in, this, uh, in our discussion, we had a question from uh, our good friend, Lisa Durf, and I wanted to share this. She asks, this is a general question. I think this applies to almost everything. So in what ways must institutions change to not go over the brink? So I, I think she's talking about not, not being at the brink of the break glass moment, but but you know, what should we do to not approach that uh, that terrifying zone? You know, I, I would start, Brian, and it, it's again something that we describe in the ways what every campus should know are the questions that need to be asked, right? And um, and there are some fundamental and kind of basic tools that are available to campuses that present kind of a transparency of where you are, how you're doing, and how can we improve. And I'll give you one example. I have a huge bias. It's not loved on most campuses by virtue of governance structures and, and other things. But I'll contend today, if you're not utilizing a good academic performance portfolio, some unit-based cost analysis of, of your delivery of instruction, that you simply do not know how you're doing. Mm. Right. So how many programs you do, ha do you have? How many faculty does it take to staff them? How many students are enrolled? Mm -hmm. How much net tuition do they generate? And most of my friends in strategic finance would hope that you'd have 40% or maybe perhaps in the range of 40 to 60% of your programs presenting enough net revenue to pay for the cost of instruction. Now, I would give you an example. At Henderson, we had no programs that right. presented enough net revenue. Now you're saying, well, Chuck, it's all about money. Well, no, it's not all about money. It's how well do we do in helping our students succeed? Mm -hmm. Are they attractive and are they of demand? Mm -hmm. Do we keep them long enough to complete their degrees? And from a philanthropy standpoint, do they appreciate their degrees to perhaps give something back even as alumni? Yeah. Well, if the answer is all those are yes, then, and if you can do that with your most challenged students, so your graduation rates for your Pell eligible students, right? Your graduation rates for first generation students, your persistence rates from first to second year students, the better you're doing, right? In helping those students be successful in college, the better your performance is going to be fiscally with your overall institutional performance, right? Very, very simple. So campuses can utilize tools and data informed decisions to really not go into exigency, retrenchment, cost cutting, but just simply do better. And if you do better over time, it's the same thing as doing poorly over time, right? It accumulates to being a much better institution in the value that you're presenting to the students to answer that value proposition. You could say it becomes a structural advantage. I, I think transparency about an institution's finances are, are essential. Mm -hmm. Mm. on a on a regular basis um, that's why i believe it's important to have campus-wide structures in place that monitor the budget and the financial condition of the institution uh, so that it, it it isn't something that arises in a crisis it's part of the way you do business um, yeah when, yeah when, when uh, i had budget hearings at missouri state the deans and the vice presidents had to make their budget requests in front of each other so there were no secrets. It was an open book as far as the budget was concerned. Nice. And that, that doesn't happen at all universities, I, I know. Yeah. Um, I also think, as Chuck was suggesting, when you do your academic program review, you at the same time have to inspect the non-academic parts of the university, the administrative um, and, and staff levels, um, for a couple of reasons. One is there, there is some excess there and second it's it's just uh, asking for trouble to only put academic programs under the microscope and not do it for administration and athletics wow. and student yeah. support and all yeah. the other uh, a aspects of the university that's part of transparency is to make sure those offices 
are subjected to the same budgetary overview as academic programs. Even though academic programs account for most of where the money is spent, it's essential that you bring everybody to that same table. Thank you. Thank you. We, I'm, friends, I'm conscious of the fact that we're coming close to the end of our hour, and I want to make sure we get to share as many questions as possible. And you can see that uh, Chuck and Mike are so fantastic with answers that I want to make sure that everyone gets a, a chance. We'll to stop take filibustering. Oh, you're not filibustering. <laughs> I was hoping um, somebody would come on stage. I, this shindig platform, I like. So. Yeah, me too. That's always my favorite part. Uh, but let me ask one from uh, Dmitry Zakharov, who is at uh, with Toffler Associates. He asked a very good question. And this comes up in your book as well. Do you expect to see institutions trying to tap new non-traditional revenue sources? Technology commercialization, intellectual property is one that comes to mind, but there are plenty of others. Oh, absolutely. I, and, and uh, you know, there's many examples of institutions who are doing that and then not only uh, monetizing in regards to diversification, but bringing it right back into the classroom and instructional outcomes for uh, means of, of really thinking differently about, right, not only competencies, but, but experience. Uh, you know, I, I've very much valued um, some friendships at Arizona State, right? And, and of course, they're very easily identified, but there's many Arizona State examples that are happening every day on a lot of different campuses. Uh, you'll see uses of campus assets for mixed-use developments. You'll see opportunities for uh, P20 programs that extends directly to talent pipelines for corporate partnerships. There's, there's many, many new ways. And again, I, I think, Brian, that's what I led with. That's, that's really creating the future of what college is going to look like. Mm. Uh, and that's pretty exciting. Uh, that, that's where I, I think, Dimitri, uh, that especially for young professionals to start to think differently about what college is and, and, and maybe perhaps flipping the model. Uh, as we were reimagining Henderson, uh, we said the first requisite are, you know, basically is what's what's the most pressing needs for skills, talents, and capacity in the community, mm -hmm. and how do we align our programs to meet those needs? And I think the more that you do that, the more you have opportunities to diversify outcomes as well as uh, potential sources of resources. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it's a great question, um, and thank you for the for the an solid answer. Uh, we have a, a more futuristic. Uh, looking question, and by future, I mean looking ahead to say June. Um, and this comes from uh, our, our good friend Charles Finley at uh, Northeastern, um, and who asks a question dear to my heart, um, which is, um, whoop, excuse me, I'll just press the wrong button here. Um, speaking of deferred maintenance, how does or will operational costs associated with climate crisis, such as heating and cooling, impact the brink? Brian, you ought to answer that one. That's right. I, Brian, I want your answer. <laughs> you, you, yeah, we want I to hear done. from you on that one. <laughs> well, I, I have done and, and, and at length, and, uh, and uh, more, more examples of this keep, uh, keep coming up, I'm afraid. Um, but uh, it, it seems, you know, that we have all kinds of costs around this, depending on where you are geographically. You know, your exposure to cold, but also your exposure to not just heat, but heat and humidity. Uh, so, you know, the exposure to a school in Arizona is very different from one in Georgia. But I'm, I'm, I'm curious. I mean, I'm, I'm just facilitating right now. I, I, I don't want to be the, the speaker here. I'm curious, Chuck and, and Mike, what you're seeing in your consulting work as you're talking to uh, campus leaders of all kinds. Are you seeing any, any uh, planning or awareness of how people should look ahead 5, 10, 15 years out for the impact of climate change? So, so I'll, I'll give you a, a today example. It, uncanny that the question, and, and I would like to say something about Northeastern and what a, a great kind of creating the future they've got in their applied learning space and, you know, contemporizing that co-op model to a whole other level. And obviously the response students and, and potential prospective students are giving to that institution. So you're, you're in a great place. But I, I had a, in, in honor of March Madness, I, I'm a, a Furman grad and this time last year we were upsetting Virginia in the first round. It was the biggest thing that ever happened, right? But a young man who was an alum 
a uh, member of the alumni association contacted me a couple of weeks ago and said, hey, can we do a call? I'm working for uh, a uh, environmental sustainability company in New York. Uh, I and my group does uh, assessments, right, to assist institutions in reducing carbon footprint and contemporizing, right, because of the enrollment uh, encouragement that this next gen of students are looking for sustainable campuses. That it's it's an enrollment uh, driver, uh, and this is a, a relatively uh, recent graduate who has found this space, wants to be in higher ed, and is brokering relationships quite effectively to come in and do campus-based assessments to build out. And uh, in the old days, Brian, we would have called them ESCO projects, right, where you. Yeah. Uh, leverage the, the utility savings to do the, the campus improvements. Of course, they're going much further than that now with alternative energy and uh, other options, right, that brings in lots of tax credits and potential P3s and other things. But here's a young man who uh, is just out of school, a former student athlete, uh, who's found this path to be really a, a great uh, economic mobility driver for himself, right? So. I think, you know, the more that we engage our students and learning outcomes in those types of objectives, the, you know, again, it'll benefit the institution, but it'll also benefit our, our, our graduates. Mike, you, you know, you, you probably have another take on that. No, I, I, I think you're going to see schools experiment with four day uh, uh, week uh, work weeks. Um, we're seeing that in K through 12 as a way to save some. Uh, money, so you may see some some of that. Uh, they're going to try to shrink some of the physical footprint, and uh, mm -hmm. so you're going to see uh, residence halls uh, perhaps shuttered, uh, particularly as enrollment declines. Smart mm. schools will be looking at some at least intermediate steps like that. I think. Mm. Mm. Um, you've given us both a very solid glimpse of uh, of what's to come. Um, I, I think we have time for uh, one last question. Uh, and this is from uh, our European friend, uh, Philip Lingard, uh, who asks, uh, it's, it's a very polite question. I think it goes a little further than that. So I'm going to take a moderator's privilege to expand on it a bit. Uh, are institutions looking to expand their income by recruiting internationally? And I, I think the expansion is to, is to say that recruiting more internationally, um, but also with some of the problems that are uh, attending on that right now. I'll take a first run at it, Chuck, real quick. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, and we have seen international enrollments in U.S. institutions rebound a bit from a low point uh, three or four years ago, frankly, uh, partly in reaction to what was perceived as some pretty hostile policies by the then Trump administration. Um, usually for the public institutions, international students pay a, a premium over the in-state tuition um, that yeah. resident students provide. So you're seeing that, um, I think you're seeing that increase and you're seeing, uh, in terms of the efforts, you're also seeing more universities begin to partner in um, contracted relationships with institutions where uh, mm. Mm. They're, they're arranging for transfer programs. First two years at at the host country school, and then you come and finish your degree in finance or accounting or whatever uh, yeah. at the uh, U.S. Uh, institution. One last thing, some institutions even do a cohort discount mm -hmm. for students mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. international institutions so that mm -hmm. rather than paying the full uh, load tuition, students, if there are 20 that come from a given school, their tuition might be discounted down to 80%. Um, something uh, like that. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's heating back up, particularly as you're, at least currently, students perceive the U.S. as being a, a bit more open to them and receptive to them than they were a few years back. The only thing I would add, Brian, relevant to this conversation, and I have lived experience with expansive international enrollment, uh, mm -hmm. a contraction, uh, and then uh, seeing it expand again, which is, is excellent for students and, and institutions because it just incredibly increases the diversity of our campuses and mm -hmm. the overall uh, just intellectual capacity. But institutions need to value it, but not rely on it. 
right? Because there are external factors beyond many institutions' controls that it can perhaps not be as consistent uh, as you would like to think for long-term mm-hmm. uh, ability, right? So uh, use it wisely, uh, invest in it, uh, but also always keep your contingencies that things can happen that either narrows or, or broadens that opportunity. Yeah, that's a very good point. You want to be careful that your your resident parents and families don't think that their children are being displaced by too much right. of a emphasis on international or non-resident students, which I think some flagship universities may be risking these days. Indeed, indeed. Well, I think ending on a point of wisdom is uh, the best way uh, for us to conclude. Uh, I'm afraid we're at the end of the hour and we we need to put a bow on on all of this. Uh, Chuck, Mike, thank you for being just a fantastic pair of guests. What's the best way to keep up with your work and, and your thinking? Should we wait for the next book, or are there other ways that we can uh, keep an eye on you? I'm glad you mentioned that because I'm I'm bending Mike's arm for the next book because I I, I I can't write one without him. But I'll join. Uh, you. We can share uh, appropriately, Brian. Whatever conduits for contact information is possible, we'd be glad to uh, extend it in the chat. Or uh, hmm. s- certainly would like to make connections and always willing to. To learn from each other, right? So we'd, we'd, we'd love to do that. With and, and, and thank you for the thoughtful questions today. Well, and and, and Chuck, we can we can keep an eye on you through uh, uh, Hush Blackwell, right? You can. And uh, and Mike, we have to uh, uh, keep on you to keep uh, pumping out those Forbes pieces, right? We'll do. Thanks again, Brian, well, for thank, hosting us today. Thank you both. I, I I can't recommend your book highly enough, and I I can't recommend the two of you highly enough. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone who listened. Yep, thank you, Brian. But uh, don't go away, everybody, yet. I need to uh, uh, just point to a couple of things, but I want to thank you. Uh, thank you both, uh, or sorry, thank all of you uh, for the wonderful questions. Uh, we've really covered a wide range of territory, everything from uh, debt to strategy to uh, classrooms. I Thank you all. Um, listen, if you'd like to keep talking about this, um, you can do this across all social media. Here are some of my handles, as well as using the hashtag FTTE. If you'd like to go look into our previous sessions where we've talked about campus strategy and campus finance since the beginning, just go to our archive at tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. If you'd like to look at our upcoming sessions, just head to the forum website and you can see some of the topics that we have coming up. And again, let me thank you all uh, for your great questions and comments. This has been a real pleasure and I think uh, a really great way for us to think about how higher education might advance. Um, Until next time, everyone, take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.